as the Executive Director of the Flint Institute of Arts, Museum and Art School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Coffee with Curator. Thank you to our sponsor, Big B Coffee, for the free coffee and goodies that we um, are sharing with you this morning. It's also, uh, I would like to also thank, scripts, I say it right? The Ford Foundation, Equity Fund of the Community Foundation of Greater Flint for making the ASL interpretation possible. And the next copy of the curator isn't into the fall, so I don't have any specific details on it, but take the stay tuned for that. And um, I'm not a curator anymore, but it's my pleasure to return to this program. Uh, one of our curators is on maternity leave, so I, I, I volunteered to fill it in for her. And it's a great topic that I want to share with you today. It has a special place in my heart because way back in 2009, my first job at the Flint Institute of Arts was working on the Rinaldo and Armida tapestries, as well as all of the furniture in the room. So it was, it, so it will always hold a very special place in my heart. My presentation on the Great Tapestry Cycle has a lot of information, so I decided to split it up into three parts. The first will explore how the tapestries got here. The second, the story. And the third, the relationship of the tapestries to other works in the Bray Renaissance Gallery. So act one is from Paris to Flint. First, let me say how rare it is to know the journey of a work of art, especially the one that's almost 400 years old. There are usually many gaps in what art historians call provenance, which is the history of ownership. And it's not uncommon, as you will, can imagine, things change hands, the histories get lost, and you just always don't have a paper trail. But in the case of our tapestries, we literally do, and it's quite exciting. So I, we can account for the 383 year and 6,293 mile journey. First, the place that it was made in Paris, France, at the Faubourg Saint Germain workshop uh, led by Raphael de la Planche. And how do we know that that is the case? That in, in the tapestry's border, we have the P. P. Uh, from Paris, the fleur de lis, which is the royal symbol, and then R is for Raphael de la So that's how we know where it was made. We also know that it was based on paintings by Simon Louvet, who was first painter to the king. It was King Louis the Thirteenth of France. So the, the tapestries were based on his paintings, which still exist but in a private home in Paris. They were translated into what's called cartoons or drawings, and then the tapestry weavers would base their, their, their tapestry on those drawings. We also know who commissioned the work. The King of France was chief minister from 1642, Cardinal Jules, uh, Jules Mazarin, ordered the tapestries in about 1633 but he did not buy them. They were finished in 1637 and bought by this man, Cardinal Antonio Barberini, and he bought, we actually know the day he bought them, December 12, 1637. The Italian Cardinal Antonio Barberini, was, his uncle was Pope Urban VIII, and he made him a cardinal at the young age of 20 years old. With his brothers, Francesco and Taddeo, he helped to shape politics, religion, and art, and music of the 17th century. Antonio walked the tapestries and took them to his home, very modest home, um, the Palazzo Barberina, Barberini, and this is in Rome, and you can still go here today. It is now a museum, so you can actually walk around where the tapestries, and I did have a chance to do that. It was a lot of fun. They were not hung chronologically. They were split up into two rooms. Seven were in the audience hall of his elder brother, Francesco, and three of them were hung in a bedroom or bed chamber. On October 2nd, 1639, some of the tapestries were led to the Church of Hill Jesu in part of a visit, in part of a visit celebrating Pope Urban VIII, remember that as his uncle, and 
the 100th anniversary of the Jesuit order. So this is the Jesuit church, and the, this was in celebration of this. So this is a painting on the right showing the, the Pope's visit. You can see all the people here. This gives you an idea of scale. This is the people. And then the tapestries were hung up here on either side of the church. And a modern art historian actually recreated what they looked like. Um, and here's one of our tapestries right here. So this is a digital reconstruction of what the, what the tapestries look like hanging in the church. And there's other ones that don't belong to our cycle. He had a lot of tapestries, <laughs> Barbary. And then here's another one that we'll see in detail later. But again, you can just sort of see the scale. Here is um, a chapel on the doorway there. So very large scale church. And, and we're, it's very interesting that we had this record of them being on view in the church. The tapestries were returned to the Barberini Palace and stayed there until Princess Barberini sold them to an American collector in 1889. So in the inventory of 1695, it was still there. It was sold in 1889 to lots of tapestries, not just ours, uh, to Charles Madigal, he was an American wool merchant, and he brought the tapestries back to his home, Folk House, in Washington, D.C. And there they lived. Until 1913. Um, it was, well, he died, Charles Weatherfolk died in 1909, so shortly after his death, they were sold to Florence Vanderbilt Fondly, and she had a body in 1913. This is a portrait by John Singer Sargent. So this is Hamilton McCollum Top Twadley, um, or also known as Florence Vanderbilt. And she brought them to her home at Florham Farm Estate in Convent, New Jersey. So there the tapestries lived until she died um, in her dates here. Not her date. oh, she died in 1952, and then the, the tapestries were sold, um, or actually they descended to her daughter Ruth who sold them at auction June 15th, 1955, where they were bought by French and Company, starting to get closer to Flint now. <laughs> um, at that auction, um, they, Mitchell Samuels, who was one of the directors of French and Company, this is a black and white photo showing their um, storeroom. It's not our tapestries, but just to give you a flavor of what the storeroom would have looked like. And what's interesting is we actually do have an image of a storeroom of the showroom, I should say, where our tapestries were on view. And you probably will recognize some of the other things, like the candlestick, sticks, the table, this uh, ceramic wine cistern, the fire, the, the, uh, the eight irons in the fireplace, this table. That's all in the Red Gallery right now. And of course, the tapestries. So they were on view like this when in Dates, right? The day after Christmas, Mrs. Gray, I'm seeing here on the right, she's seated, her, her daughter is on, um, on the left. Mrs. Gray was a Flint native and philanthropist, and whose husband, Everett, was one of the lawyers who brokered the deal to create General Motors. Mrs. Gray had a passion for collecting glass, particularly paper weights, which are on view in uh, Paperway Hallway. But she bought the tapestry collection and the company furnishings strictly for our museum. So in 1958, our museum was actually very small. It had just a few galleries. So not only did she purchase all of these artworks for the museum, she also paid for a gallery to be added on in 1961. And this is the image of the gallery that opened in 1961 that had the look and feel of an Italian Palazzo, just like where they were originally in the Barberini Palace. And you can see the molded ceilings and just the layout. It's also very similar to what was in the showroom, only a lot less, I think, cluttered, it's much nicer, spread out. So the day after Christmas, December 26, 1959, she bought these 
And of course, the, ballot, the gathering had not been built yet, so everything went into storage until it was ready, and it was in storage in, in New York until it came here. Sadly, uh, Mrs. Bray died in March 1961, before the gallery opened in November, so she just uh, died a few months before the gallery opened to the public. Her legacy obviously lives on, though, in this gallery. In other words, she donated and provided funds to purchase. So that's how the tapestries got here. Now in Act Two, we're going to talk about the story. It's I call it Sleeping with the Enemy, uh, which I think you'll understand why in a minute. So the story is based on a very, very long poem by Torcato Tasso, who was an Italian poet. There's his life in our record of the death dates. So he died before the tapestries were made in 1633. But the poem lived on in many ways. People loved this poem. And there was a lot of artistic representations of the poem, especially the story of Rinaldo and Armida. And I think you'll see why it has a lot of juicy uh, bits to it. And because it lived on in paintings, uh, and, the, and the, the, the poem was very popular, it was a logical light. It was sort of a no-brainer for tapestries able to be made of this story. It's, the poem is called Jerusalem Liberata, or Jerusalem, Jerusalem Delivered. It's a fictionalized story of the First Crusade in 1099. This poem inspired many artists and musicians, as, as I mentioned. And then, um, but the poem that we're gonna, the part of the story that we're gonna focus on today is actually only six cantos of 20. Like I said, it's a very long poem. And it focuses on the story. So we're talking about a 1633 tapestry looking back to a 16th century poem looking back to a 12th century or 11th century um, the crusaders going to the Holy Land to take back the Holy Land from the, uh, what they felt were the uh, infidels. So I'm going to go through the take each panel in the chronological order. It's something we can't do when we're in the gallery because they are hung by size and you can't get them all in the right order. So you have to have some mental gymnastics to get it. So the first panel is Armida, about to kill the sleeping Rinaldo. And Armida is on the left, Rinaldo is on the right, and here she holds a dagger. She is a Saracen princess, he is a Christian crusader. So they are mortal enemies, she wants to kill him. But instead, Cupid, the god of love, shoots her with an arrow, and instead she falls in love with him. Now he's sleeping, he's actually in a enchanted sleep. Um, if you look at the, just, the two figures up at the top, they, with their magic wand, they have put him into this sleep. But she remains, And this panel, which is called Rinaldo Carried to Armida's Enchanted Chariot, he's still asleep. As the poem explains, she has a magical island that no one can see in the middle of the Europe, uh, Mediterranean. And she has flying dragons. In the poem, it's flying dragons, but on the tapestry, it's horses. She has flying dragons that will take them to her secluded island. And just take a look at everything that's going on here. We have Keep it coming in with roses, about to shower them. Um, he's, again, he's, he's in this magical trance. And of course, she's just fixated her gaze on him. She is, is in deep love. The next panel is Armida driving her chariot. So now you, um, you have to imagine that <laughs> Rinaldo's back here somewhere. He's cut out of the frame. But she's, she's now flying the chariot over to the magical island. There she is. The next is, so the other part of the story that's going on at the same time is, you know, he's defected from 
his, his army duty, right? He's left the battlefield. So what, what do they do? They go looking for him. His comrade in arms, um, Carlo and Ivaldo, they're also Christian crusaders. They go looking for him. And they've been given certain tools to help in their quest. And one of the things that they were told to do is not to take any food or drink from anybody that they encounter on the journey. So these are two water nymphs. And they're inviting them to take a drink. You know, it's very dusty and hot, and just want to drink of water. Come and have some water with us. And we're not fully full, so come on in, you know. Uh, it's all right. But they've been warned, so they know not to do it. And it's a good thing, because that's the fountain of laughter. And if they drank from it, they would die of laughter. So they pass that test. That's just another close up. I just, this is just a technical achievement. This is all woven diapers, right? But you can see through the water, the water's translucent. You see that the, the nymphs legs. I think that's just kind of a really great technical achievement. So then the next, uh, they've arrived at the island. Finally, they've discovered it. And this time, uh, Rinaldo's up, he's awake. And he's fallen in love with her too. So here they are, the, the happy couple right here. And take note of this mirror that he holds for her. She's putting pearls in her hair, and then he's, he's reclining like this. And that's going to be important later, so just take note of the mirror. And then on the left, you see the spies in the, in the, in the foliage there. They're peeking at the lovers. Um, they're trying to strategize what they're going to do. And notice, again, the, the little cupids bringing flowers and, and drinks of water to them. It's a very, very idyllic uh, moment. But that's all about to come to an end. This is Rinaldo. Um, again, they've been given magical tools to help him out of his, um, his spell. And one of them is a diamond shield. So they, his Carlo and Rinaldo here are holding the diamond shield right here. And you see he's this is the moment that his spell is broken because he saw his face and he realizes that he's been under a spell. And so he sort of, the moment he wakes up. And then notice, in contrast, that mirror he was holding with her. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is that on the sides of the mirrors are sirens, which are female figures that lure men to their death um, through their voice. And the bottom half of the women are the serpents, and the top is a beautiful woman. So, sort of, again, you can tell the commentary about <laughs> what's going on here just based on some of the symbols. And I'm going to get more into the symbols later. So he's out of his spell, he's woken up, he gets on the boat to go back to a uh, battlefield. And here he is. And I think he sort of feels I can read into it a little bit, and he feels a little bit of regret that he wants to longingly look at her. But she's definitely uh, upset. Here she is on the shore, swooned. She's cast out. And there she is. That's just another close up of that. So, what does a woman do who's been scorned? Remember I said she was a sorcerer a princess at the beginning. She has magical powers, and here's the moment where she's conjuring up all the demons from hell to help avenge her um, on what what she's been, what has happened to her. But and this happens all off. It doesn't. It, this is all off. It's in the. If you read the poem, you can read about the battle. But in, in the next uh, panel. She has been defeated, so now she's leaving the field of battle. So even with the magical powers that didn't help, she was on the wrong side of history. And so what does she do? She decides to take her life. So this last panel, I don't know if I mentioned, there's 10 panels with some tent scene. The 10th panel, here she is about to um, put, impale herself with a, an arrow. So remember at the beginning, she was impelled with an arrow, but it was for love, and now she's going to commit suicide. And 
as in all great love stories, he has a change of heart. He comes back to the island and he grabs her arm just in the nick of time. So you can see that right here. That moment where he, you know, Baroque art, I think an easy way to understand Baroque art is that it's always about the drama. You know, the, the exact moment something's about to happen. And so I think when you look at uh, objects from this time period, you can always see that, that really moment. So we have to go to the poem, though, to really understand the ending. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Notice up here, another but this time instead of flowers, they're bringing a palm leaf, which is a symbol of martyrdom. So in the poem, she's converted to Christianity before she dies, and she bequeaths all of her lands and crown to Ronaldo. So she does die, but she dies a Christian martyr, and that's the end of the story. So lots of pathos, lots of drama in this story. And I, I, I hope you just thought a little bit of it. It's been a subject of an opera, so I don't know if you have ever seen it, you know, an Armenian opera. I haven't, but I found this clip online of Renee Fleming. So just a quick clip. And I'm going to let everyone guess which scene you're hearing here. And they have multiple. 
so we'll be names we've been out and simple. And I'm going to show you, I think, at least one of them during this talk. So to get an idea of what I mean by symbols and how they relate to the love story, I will look at what's going on in the borders. So the borders tell us a lot. First of all, they're made to look like three-dimensional frames. The borders, they uh, also are loaded with clues on the overall story. For example, the figures on the corners. Up here and up here. They're twins, so they, they mirror each other. Um, this is a female figure um, with, with wings holding tr trumpets. And then on the lower corners, there are two wrestling satyrs. Satyrs are half men, half goat figures. And in classical mythology, they hung out in forests. They were known to be uh, imbibers of lots of wine and also uh, very sexually um, active. <laughs> so putting the two together, what does this mean? So we have this figure, winged figure of trump trumpets, and the meaning of this symbol is, is victory. I'll show you in a minute with it. And then on, on the corners here, there are, these are symbols of lust. So the, the fact that the triumphal uh, figures are at the top and the lustful figures at the bottom is showing you that in this whole series, Rinaldo is supposed to triumph over his lust. And he does in the end, right? He, he shows that. This, uh, the, the winged figure dates all the way back to um, the ancient period. This is the wing, Greek uh, winged victory of Nike of Samothrace in the Musée de Louvre in Paris. And you can see in that, and this was um, again a figure of victory, so it, it, it dates back much earlier than uh, Christianity. And then, as I mentioned, there's the, the satyrs. Um, Pan is the god of the forest. And he would frolic, and he was also in charge of uh, the Bacchanal, um, the, the, the followers of Bacchanal, who was the god of wine. They would go to the forest and drink lots of wine, get naked, and yeah, pull up your, your fill in the blanks. So, also, there are uh, lots of symbols up um, above. It's hard to see in the, in the gallery, which is why I'm we're gonna get really up close for you because you know they, they um, once you start looking a little deeper, you can see that how these things all connect together. Our 21st century eyes often don't catch the meaning of it because we don't have that same visual language and background that they had at the time. But if you were growing up in the Renaissance or the Baroque period, you would if you were educated person, you would have been exposed to these stories and these images a lot, so you would get the meaning right away. I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, let me come back one second. For example, this on the top here, there is the scallop shell. It's almost, oh, sorry. One more time. It's hard to miss. I mean, it's hard to see in the gallery, but it's right up here at the very, very top. And the scallop shell was associated with the uh, goddess Venus, the goddess of love. And here's a Botticelli painting, the birth of Venus, because the classical mythology said that, oops, that, she, that she actually was born in the ocean, and she rode to shore on the scallop shell. She didn't have a mother, her father, and this guy's part of mother's semen got into the ocean, and that's what she, she was born out of the ocean. So a scallop shell became associated with Venus. So it makes sense that it's on this tapestry because there's other symbols in the tapestry that relate to love and including pearls, also associated with Venus, and then roses. Those were also associated with love. So it's, it, it's there for that reason. But remember where it takes place. Jerusalem, and in at this time period, if you were a pilgrim, uh, you were you were going on a holy pilgrimage, traveling from your home to the Holy Land. When you arrived there, you would get a scallop 
half shell as a symbol of your pilgrimage. And so here's two paintings of the time or of, of different time periods, but just to show you the symbol, the, the scallop shell. So here's a symbol that functions on two levels, got goddess of love and also pilgrimage. And there's the symbol there. Because ultimately that's why Rinaldo was there, is to take the Holy Land back so that pilgrims could uh, walk uh, on the Holy Land without giving a, a, a threat. Friend. Also, there's palm branches in holding these Puti uh, figures, the babies. They're holding the palm branches. We talked about that briefly in association with pilgrim, I'm mean, sorry, martyrdom. But there, again, there's another meaning to it. And in the illustrated books of the time showing symbols, they would, uh, they would show two cupids here with beating each other with palm branches. So it's sort of, and, it, and the, the, the title is Come Back to More or the Love, you know, love Fight. So the fight of love. So again, there's again there's two levels of meaning depending on how you read the tapestries. And then here is a gold coin showing uh, victory right here, holding a palm leaf. So again, multiple levels, one symbol. And of course, here's an image of Saint Lucy um, holding a palm branch. She was martyred, uh, she was blinded, so that's why she she showed holding eyes in one hand. And here's the badass panel where she becomes a Christian and, and, and dies, and, he, and dies, and here comes the, the Buddha. There's also interesting figures in what's called cartouches. There's these little rectangular or oval figures in the entre fenetra. That's just a uh, word would be between the windows because they were narrow tapestries, so they could fit in between windows. They only have two, one at the top and one at the bottom. But in the larger tapestries, they always have four, two in the um, left and right, and then two on the top and bottom. This is a fun one. This is of the god Mars. So the god Mars was the god of war, and it is said that the only time that he is said that he's ugly. It also is said that he the only person that would would want to have sex with would want to have sex with them was Venus. So we've already talked a little bit about Venus. Um, and then it's the only time when he puts his weapons down. So if you notice here. All his weapons are at his feet, and he's reclining. So he's not war, he's not at war. So it mimics what's happening here with Rinaldo. He's a soldier, but he's not fighting. He's just laying there. It's like the symbol of um, being uh, the opposite of masculinity. You know, you are not fighting. You are reclining, and you would only he would only do that when he was in love. This symbol up here is um, Calliope. She's one of the nine muses of the daughters of Zeus and Memosini, which means memory. These were goddesses of creative inspiration in the arts. In the case of Calliope, she is the muse of epic poetry. So it makes sense that she's on this tapestry because it's based on an epic poem. She's often strong holding a tablet, like she is right here. And um, again, relating back to the poem. This one here you might all recognize. Um, you've seen it uh, before. It's a slight difference though, and that's a woman holding scales. Anyone want to guess? Just yes. yes. But in this time frame, interestingly, she's not blindfolded. <laughs> so that is the difference in, in this uh, time that she showed with the scales. And with, uh, with a staff, but she's not shown. And then up at the top, we're going to talk about this a little more detail later, so I'm not going to bring too much up. This is 
figure of fortitude. So in one tapestry, we have a mythological god, a, an allegorical figure, to actually justice and fortitude, and then a muse of, of poetry. Fortitude, and that you see up at the top here, is based on a story in the Bible about Samson um, in, in grief. Samson loses his power to a woman, uh, who, Delilah, who tricks him into cutting off his hair, and his hair is the source of his strength. So he loses his strength, and but it, in how the story goes, he eventually gets it back, but doesn't tell anybody. And here he is in the center here, bringing down the Philistine temple with just his hands. He's bringing down the two columns, and of course everybody in there, including himself, is going to die as a result, but it was him getting victory over the Philistines. So fortitude in, in classical and in Renaissance symbols is shown with this pillar in reference to this. So again, it's showing the strength of, of character that it, would, that it would take to do something so like this, that knowing you're going to die. And if you, if you think about a lot of these themes that I'm mentioning, and you put it in the background of what was going on at this time in Europe, which is the Thirty Years' War, it was a fight between France and the Netherlands and uh, other countries in, in Europe over religion. So it's basically Catholicism and Protestants fighting each other. So it's interesting to me that this tapestry, which is depicting a war that was much, much earlier, but has those similar things, like putting your, putting your country or your religion before yourself, of, of having victory over lust, of duty over desire. So I think that you see that a lot in, in, in this tapestry and things like the symbol of fortitude certainly reinforce that. So one symbol that I haven't talked about yet in these tapestries is what's on every single one of them, and that's the symbol of the heart. They are all around the borders. I just this is a detail of, of one of the corners. And um, I counted more than 400 hearts um, in, the, in the tapestries. Um, and, and I was interested about that because like, where did the heart shape come from? And we, some of you think with us to, to us today, I probably wouldn't even need to ask you what it means. If, if I, if, if, well, what does it mean? What does the heart stand for? love, right? So it's something that's very common with us, but where did it come from? So I did a little digging and scholars traced it back to the Middle Ages, um, and it's, but its appearance and shape can actually be seen even earlier. So they think it's based on this plant here. It has a heart shape. So you can see that heart shape there. And it's the silkium plant used in the ancient times as an herbal contraceptive. <laughs> but people also saw it as a shape relating to the female body. A shapely woman's body. Um, by the 1630s, when these tapestries were made, uh, the heart shape was often used in art to represent love, both romantic and spiritual. As shown in this manuscript page, uh, showing this gentleman here, Pierre, it has made his heart right there, and a Marguerite flower, his mistress's name was Marguerite, oh, lots of coded symbols there, uh, but that, that dates to 1500. And of course, as I mentioned, it's a symbol we all know, we, it's just very easy to, to, to uh, when people do this, we, we, we immediately know what it means. So, and the next time you're in the galleries, I want you to, and you can do this after, this first line of gold molding our hearts. And it's such a great thing that, that when the gallery was made uh, and, and, and designed for these tapestries, 
that the workmen um, and the craftsmen that were involved in the war men, so I can say that they decided to, or they decided to have that heart. I'm sure that Mrs. Bray and even Ms. Mitchell Samuels, who was advising on the project, really wanted that kind of detail in there. So I thank you for all your patience and listening to me today. I uh, hope you learned something about our tapestries. They're very special to the Flint Institute of Arts. They're the only set of 10 tapestries that depict this cycle in the whole world. And we're so lucky to have them here. I can stick around for questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you.
she shoots another one at him and pins his hand to her head with her fist arrow so she can't get it out. It's, just, it's, just, it's great. If you like, like, actions, you know, and there's a lot of stuff like that throughout it.